Hey everyone. I uh, first want to thank everybody for the, the kind comments and emails that you sent. Uh, appreciating the my early video on wildfires and climate. And today I want to talk about uh, aridity, how drying and warming of our earth is affecting agriculture, fisheries, uh, fresh drinking water for people and, and drying the land uh, and drying the ground fuels that might uh, exacerbate wildfires. And today I'm just going to focus on one aspect, uh, landscape changes. And in part two, I'll deal with how natural cycles affect aridity. Now, hopefully scientists can guide land managers in how best to deal with changes in, in aridity. But there's a problem. Science is sort of mired in the aridity paradox. And what that means is there's one group of scientists that will argue it's human activities that are the key to drying out landscapes, which dries out the aridity, which causes rising temperatures. And if that's the case, better uh, landscape management is going to be our solution. On the flip side, there's other scientists who are arguing that it's rising CO2 that's increasing warming and increasing evaporation, and that results in increased aridity. There's a simple key concept to understand the relationship between temperatures and moisture called evaporative cooling. We understand that uh, personally when we sweat, that liquid water evaporates, creating water vapor and pulls away all this energy that would otherwise go to heating our bodies, thus keeping us cool. Many animals experience the same thing only by panting because the only place where evaporative cooling can happen is on their moist tongues. Similarly, landscapes can stay cooler by evaporative cooling. And when you dry the landscape, you prevent evaporative cooling and temperatures will rise. Now, altering the vegetation of a landscape can reduce evaporative cooling. Plants must pull water from the subsurface to pull up all the minerals and nutrients direct that water up through their stems out to the leaves where it evaporates out into the surface through their stomata. If you totally denude an area of its vegetation, you're going to prevent such evaporative cooling. But you don't have to denude the vegetation completely. You can simply alter the composition of the landscape. Plants that have very deep roots can uh, reach water that's much deeper pull water up through their leaves for a much longer period and provide more evaporative cooling throughout a longer season. In contrast, invasive annual grasses like cheatgrass have very shallow roots. They absorb the moisture only from the surface. They set seeds and die, and then they are unable to uh, support evaporative cooling in the landscape for a much longer season. And satellites also show us that changes in vegetation affect temperature. Forests are the coolest surfaces. Shrublands and grasslands have much warmer surfaces. And bare ground or deserts have the hottest surface temperatures. Now, healthy watersheds also affect our microclimates. A healthy watershed has streams that are connected to the floodplains. And those floodplains can recharge the aquifers and keep the water table high thus in enabling a very healthy vegetation. Unfortunately, poor land management has degraded many watersheds. The hydrologists that I have worked with have told me that they see that 90% of California's watersheds have been degraded. In a watershed that we were monitoring for wildlife in the Sierra Nevada, we noticed that a stream that was channelized disconnected the stream from the floodplains lowered the water table and reduced biodiversity and reduced once abundant willows to sage grass. We were able to work with restoration experts and reconnect the stream to the floodplains, raise the water table and create much lusher vegetation, more abundant wildlife. And this watershed is now much more resilient uh, due to the restoration, even in the times of drought. Now, the Dust Bowl of the 1930s is a classic example of the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. After World War I, the wheat fields around the world were decimated. So to incentivize 
of more wheat production, the United States guaranteed higher wheat prices. That resulted in an area the size of Ohio to be converted from rich, uh, deep-rooted perennial grasses like buffalo, gra buffalo grasses and convert that area into wheat fields. And when the subsidy stopped and much of that land was abandoned, the Dust Bowl went into full force. The effect of the Dust Bowl and landscape changes on heat waves is clearly seen in the EPA's heat wave index. The 1930s experienced heat waves never before and never since experienced in the United States. What's also clear is there's been no recent trend in heat waves for 130 years. And that contradicts the expected correlation with rising CO2. To summarize the effects of landscape changes that dry the land surfaces, one, you can reduce evaporative cooling. Two, you reduce relative humidity that stresses plants and dries out ground fuels. Three, due to lack of water vapor, you have decreased cloud cover, which increases solar heating. And without clouds, you reduce the moisture recycling. And it is estimated that recycled moisture will triple the amount of pre precipitation that a certain landscape will undergo. Urban heat islands are partly driven by converting vegetated land to concrete and asphalt. It's clearly seen here in the heart of a downtown where there's less vegetation and more asphalt and more cement buildings, temperatures can be five to six degrees warmer than surrounding rural areas that are more heavily vegetated. Laboratory experiments have definitively shown that if you keep the energy input constant, whether it's solar energy or greenhouse effects energy, then just by changing the surface composition, you can change the temperature. If we look at dry air, it takes one joule to raise one gram of air one degree centigrade. A joule is just a measure of energy. You compare that to water, it takes four joules. And if you add to that the effect of evaporating water, it takes 2,230 joules to evaporate one gram of water. So clearly, when you dry out an area, all that energy that went into heating water or evaporating water can now raise the landscapes to a much higher temperature. If we look at wet soils, it takes about 1.8 joules to raise the temperature by one degree. If you dry that out, the dry soil, the dry soil only takes 0.8 joules. So basically, once you've dried the land, it, the surface temperature can double compared to what it would be in wet soil. And the same holds true when you put asphalt and concrete down. You can double the temperature that would happen if there was a wet soil there in place. The aridity paradox cannot be resolved by using correlations. Correlations are not causation. Although rising CO2 correlates with a warming trend, more asphalt and, and more cement, it causes a local warming trend as well. And we're seeing tremendous growth in our cities and expansions of suburbs. This graph of increasing heat waves and heat wave intensity was posted on the EPA's website. I've had many people show it to me and say, doesn't this prove that rising CO2 is causing more heat waves? But if you look carefully, the data that supports this rising trend is only from 50 large cities across the United States. And so the paradox remains, is it more asphalt and less vegetation or is it rising CO2 that's causing this rising trend in heat waves? And the effect of drying landscapes is not confined to urban settings. If we look at California, in the 1900s, most of the central part of California was wetlands. But since then, due to agricultural expansion, most of California's wetlands are gone. And it's estimated across the United States we've lost 50% of our wetlands. 
The drying of Lake Winnemucca, Nevada is another example of how landscape changes can cause dryness and higher, higher temperatures. Lake Winnemucca was fed by the drainage from Lake Tahoe through the Truckee River, entering Pyramid Lake and then spilling over to Lake Winnemucca. But in 1903, the Derby Dam started diverting water that would have flown, flowed into Pyramid Lake for agricultural purpose resulting in the drying of Lake Winnemucca. Lake Winnemucca at one time was considered a haven for waterfowl, both breeding and, and migratory. But 1960, when it finally dried up, it became the first national wildlife refuge to lose its designation. Accordingly, the drying of Lake Winnemucca caused an increase in maximum temperatures. If we compare Winnemucca's maximum temperatures over the last 130 years to Battle Mountain many miles to the south, we see that the regional temperature of Lake Winnemucca, the dash lines, increased steadily, where Battle Mountain's temperature showed a cooling trend. While the examples of drying the landscape from landscape changes and raising temperatures and causing droughts are fairly obvious, the effects of rising CO2 are much less apparent. Our understanding of, of the effects of CO2 comes from the projections from climate models. But climate models do a very poor job of modeling complex landscape changes. And as seen in the uh, model results in this illustration in blue, a, a study that was done in 2011 and then produced in the third national climate assessment, that model failed to account for the Dust Bowl, the droughts of the 1950s. All the model did was say from 2000 over the next century that we should expect a climate crisis. But if I was a land manager, I would not trust these results if they cannot reproduce such dramatic changes in drought and heat waves as we experienced during the Dust Bowl. But there is hope that science can guide land managers to better outcomes. Recent studies understanding that temperature is not the best guide to understanding how changes in the energy balance are happening use something called radiative signatures. If the CO2 hypothesis is correct, then it requires an increase in downward greenhouse infrared radiation. And it also would show no significant effect on solar radiation. In contrast, if the changing landscapes causes aridity which is causing temperature change, then that requires evidence of reduced downward greenhouse radiation, but increased solar radiation due to fewer clouds. And that's exactly what observations are showing. And that suggests that aridity is being driven and increasing warming is being driven by landscape changes. And that suggests that our best and wisest investments will go to better landscape management. The next video, part two, is going to examine how natural cycles deliver rains to the land. But until then, I advise everybody to embrace the renowned scientist Thomas Huxley's advice that skepticism is our highest of duties and blind faith is one unpardonable sin. Now, if you appreciate the science clearly presented here, science that's rarely presented in the mainstream media, then please give me a like, share it with others, subscribe to my channel, or read my book, Landscapes and Cycles, an Environmentalist Journey to Climate Skepticism. Thank you.